I commenced this devotion series uh, four weeks ago. I started it and I'm concluding it um, before we start 40 days of, of prayer with a fantastic scripture reading. And uh, I never get sick of reading this, and I reckon we've got to read it again. It, it's Dr. Luke's magnificent picture of what a New Testament church, what a church should look like. He gives us the picture of the Jerusalem church. What He describes the ethos, the feeling that's there. It's not a, a, a scientific or academic or theologically precise statement. It's a description of what that church was, was like. And... Um, I reckon we should read it because this is, this is what we want to be. This is what we work towards. So let's read this beautiful passage in Acts chapter 2. And I'm entitled in my thoughts, Welcoming Others Home. Because you get this feeling from reading the scripture. In Acts 2, 42 to 47, it says, They devoted themselves. They, people. Hundreds, thousands of them. To the apostles' teaching. What you're doing receiving the teaching from God's word in a place like this, a congregation, a, a meeting place, and to the fellowship, the life together. And we do that after we finish in here, in the community hall, but more importantly, I, I don't know how this can be done, doing life together without meeting midweek and in people's homes and, and um uh, just sharing life and to breaking of bread and to prayer we're going to finish this morning with communion together so we're going to break bread together we can do it in a large gathering we can do it also in our small groups our home groups everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles miracles occurred we've got our healing clinic the first one for the year this afternoon between two and four and people are getting healed. Jesus is healing people. Where his presence is, so is his power. And, uh, and so I encourage you if, you, if you are sick and troubled or you know people that are, that are sick and troubled and need, and the medical profession can't do anything more for them, bring them along, two o'clock in the shed. And we spend a couple of hours where we pray and believe. And he does miracles. We can't guarantee cures. We can only pray prayers of faith. And that we exercise our our believing, our praying, and leave the results to him. But it says that everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. There's a commonality here. They had everything in common. They were generous and cash shared about this. Generosity, anyone who had a need. Every day they met together, or they continued to meet together in the temple courts, the large meeting place, because there were many thousands of them, and they broke bread together in their homes. Underline that, their homes. And ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of the people. But look at this. In this environment, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We are making a really big push to see the home, your house, homes, not just the physical the physical building of your house, but your home to be a doorway by which people can come to Christ. And I think in this day and age, the role of the home in outworking Christian life and Christian ministry and evangelism is, is increasing a lot more. See, in the 1970s, when I came to Christ, um, you know, you, you, you were challenged to believe. You shared with people to believe on Jesus and then they can belong to us. Sort of, that wasn't openly stated, but it's like, hey, believe in Christ and come into the life of the church and, 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 and behold his majesty. Um, the world has changed the last 40 years and uh, marriage and family breakups are unbelievable. It's like one in, um, heading to, I think one in three marriages break up. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, there was one family in our whole area of Brooklyn Park where the kids came from a divorced family and you whispered it and it was like, oh, they're the kids, they're the, the Hopkins kids, they're like, you know, it was, it was weird. It was like, uh, uh, but it was like, oh, you, your dad's not home. You know, you, you dad, dad say that. It was like, wow, you come from a divorced family. Today, you talk to teachers, and they will say up to half of the children 
in their classes come from broken homes. And we're talking not just divorce, but then people who are in other relationships and, and there might be two men over a period of three years or, or, or two women or over five years where the kids are confused regarding who's the father, who's the mother, who's the nurturer. Um, and so marriage bust up and family breakups have caused such a lot of dysfunction in our society and ill health is on the rise. Community is breaking down. Interconnectedness is, is, is just an area of great struggle. Um, today they're saying that uh, researchers, social researchers are saying that in the Western world, 40 years ago, if you're in trouble, if you really had a significant problem, who do you turn to? You usually had about five people that you were close enough to, to be able to talk to and to share. It could be a mum, could be a dad, could be a brother, could be a sister, could be a cousin, it could be a friend, uh, someone that, that is a, is a stable person, a pillar in your life. Not a doctor or a professional or a pastor. I'm talking about just normally. Today, it's one person. In the USA, in some areas, they're saying it's going to be none. <laughs> that loneliness and isolation is so on the increase. More people than ever, but more lonely than ever. Um, in Australia, 10 years ago, the suicide rate was something like one in... Every, every day, seven people would take their life in Australia. We don't talk about it, but it's true. Seven people a day. Now it's eight. Yet the federal government and all our state governments have poured in billions of dollars, rightly so, to try and help and provide services. And thankfully, Australia is, is uh, um, doing it a lot better than, than so many other countries. But they, it doesn't solve the issue. It's not just medical science, it's not just professionalism. People need people, people need community, people need friends, people need people that they can talk to and relate to as, as, because it's not there within their families or within their social structures. The needs are huge today. Community's been disintegrating. And so today it's more like we're not saying, hey, Believe in Jesus first, then come and belong to us and, and behold his presence. It's actually, we're saying, come and belong. <laughs> come and belong and behold his presence. And, uh, and then in that environment, believe on Jesus. He's the one that makes it all possible. And so, so people need churches like ours. They need community. However, in the last 10 years, the church in Australia and, and has received such a bad name. And so today, you say, you know, out in the community, this is true, what's actually happening? There are local Catholic priests that walk down the street and they get assaulted or spat upon. Because priest, pedophile. Yet 99% of them are godly, good people. And the offences that occurred back in, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, the reality is, since 1995, there's only been a handful of Catholic priests that have been prosecuted because they brought in the protocols and, and the systems to try and deal with, with the issues of child abuse back in the early 90s, so very few now. But all the abuse the, that occurred in the, the Royal Commission uncovered, not just in the Catholic Church, in state orphanages, in, in schools, in, in, in all environments, a lot of that was, was symptomatic of, of abuse of power back then. But still, the media has taken it up, and so church is kind of viewed suspiciously. Buildings, church, okay. So I'm thinking, okay, as I'm praying over this message, is if that's the reality, the home is going to become far more important as a vehicle by which people will be introduced to Jesus Christ. Because, not just talking about your physical house, but the home that you create, the environment of hospitality and love and acceptance, my hunch is in the coming decades, the home is going to be a major vehicle by which evangelism will take place. The role of small groups. And that's why we as a church are saying, you know what? We've got 27 groups now we're going to be starting with. We'd love to have 40, 50 groups operating in the life of the Christian Family Centre. Because we think it's a major doorway by which the Lord can, can see people coming to, to faith. And... Um, the sense of belonging is, 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 is important. I know for myself, when I came to Christ in 1971 as, as, a, as a 17-year-old, I wasn't looking for Jesus. But as I've reflected back on what happened, 
I wasn't looking for him, but I got involved in, in a church. And so within several months, I felt a great sense of belonging. And uh, the presence of Christ was there in the singing, in the worship, in the preaching. But a great sense of belonging. I felt the accepting love and the fellowship of people, even though culturally, the church, I, I call it, was really square. It was like, I'm, I'm, I'm culturally on the left, the church was perhaps on the right. And I mean, we were just, I was the first long hair that came in. And a little girl that was sitting there, she was 15, and she goes, I wonder how long he'll be in there. That girl became my wife. <laughs> so culturally, we were so different. But you know what? What I felt, I, the presence of Christ was without a doubt. But, but within that, it was the love and acceptance and a, a family of people that I could sense were authentic, loving, and accepting. And uh, I felt I belonged. And then I believed six months after. So I, I actually saw that belonging, beholding his presence, and then believing it was an environment. And I stopped going for a couple of months because I needed to sort out my head, saying, man, is this a con job? Is this, is this, am I being brainwashed? You know, like, I'm, I'm doubting and questioning. And, and, but I knew what was real. So I thought, I'll just read the Bible and just make a decision on my own, whether this is for me or not for me. So I spent, I just kept on reading the scripture on my own. I get a knock on the door and it's somebody from the church. You know who it wasn't? It wasn't somebody who the pastor said, oh, that Bill Vasilakis, haven't seen him for a few weeks. I think we better send somebody to visit him. So let's say they sent Kingsley, who I didn't know. And, uh, and so Kingsley knocks on the door. I'm just picking on you, Kingsley. So knocks on the door and I say, and, and he would say, oh, hi, Bill, I'm, I'm from uh, the church and I've been asked to visit you. On, you know, um, we noticed you haven't been at church. And uh, so we are you know, concerned about that. That would have gone down like a lead balloon for me. One, I don't know him. Secondly, it was more about me attending church. But do you know who came? It was David Hersey. My friend who would talk to me on Sunday nights. And he was a lot older than me, like, oh, a lot older. I'm only a kid. I thought he was. And he was such a holy man, you know, like I used to smoke, and before I'd go to church, I'd, I'd get the peppermints in, and so I didn't bowl him over with my breath because he was so holy, you know. I thought this. So, so, but he would talk to me, and we'd share and talk, and it was a friendship. So David knocks on the door. And, and all, all that I remember is this. David's saying something like, hey, Bill, I've missed you. <laughs> I've missed you. And uh, are you okay? So, see, what was coming through was, and it was genuine. It wasn't put on love, acceptance. Hey, I've missed you. It wasn't saying, haven't been at church for a while, Bill. You know, like you're being a naughty boy. And it was out of relationship. And I felt that. And I explained to David, I said, David, I've got to sort my head out whether this is for me or not for me. But uh, that sense of accepting love is absolutely important. A an inviting environment is magnetic. And there's nothing more inviting than people who love Jesus, genuinely love each other, and are willing to embrace and welcome others to, to belong to, to the group. The early church, as we read in that scripture, Acts 2, was magnetic because the sense of life and love flowing between them was so evident. It was obvious. The people in the community go, ah, these people are different. Not only were many signs and wonders being done, confirming the manifest presence of Jesus, but the sense of joy and authentic community would have been compelling to those looking in. And as they met in large gatherings like this and in small groups, the early church was always welcoming others home. Home to God, home to God's family. And there's always room for one more person, whether it's here or whether it's in our home. My wife and I, we, we designed our latest house whenever it was, five or six years ago. And, and the number one thing that in our minds was, look, let's do the front section for us, bedroom, Little bedroom for, for you, Kath, big office for me, my own personal lounge, and, and then, cut it, then all the rest can be for hospitality, and we've got a, a room for, for guests. Oh, we've got a loft to throw the grandkids up there, got room for 12. The whole thing was geared to hospitality. 
How can we add value to people's lives by not just using our house, but creating a home that's welcoming, encouraging, and supportive, where we not just share food, but we share life and love and liberty, and the place has been used, <laughs> used and used and used for many and very... This video was done in my home, wasn't it? Yeah, because it's like a studio, that area. Good natural life. Good natural life. And so, so I don't care. It's, it, the house, it's not mine. I can't take it with me. I want a home that will be a haven of hospitality, a vehicle by which people can come to know Christ and can be impacted. And so, it's like the early Christians were saying when, when Luke was writing this passage, come and see what God is doing among us. Come and see what Christ has done for each of us. Yes, including what he's done for you. Come and eat with us. Come and spend time with us. Come and taste and see for yourself how amazing Jesus is. And so church, there's some actions I would love you to take hold of. If we're going to be New Testament Christians and the focus on the home, the small group, you read the book of Acts, it's always they're in small in homes, small groups, small groups, small groups, as well as large gatherings. In fact, the small group became more important after persecution kicked in. Once persecution kicked in by the Jewish authorities and then the Roman authorities, the role of the home became paramount in the spread of Christianity right across the empire because of some of the legal restrictions. Here's some actions. We can be this kind of church family. We don't have to wait until a Sunday or Friday service to invite someone to take a step closer to Jesus. And I want to encourage you to join a group during this 40 days of, of, of prayer, if you're not part of a, a life group, make a decision today. So, okay, I'll, I'll give it a go for the next six or seven weeks. You never know, you might like it and uh, want to continue. Or you want to become a host. So we've got 27 hosts and, and you say, oh, I don't know if I could lead a Bible study. No, no, all what you need is to press a button and Rick Warren will speak to you through the DVD. And then we'll help you how to lead a little bit of a discussion, just discussing that. And if you like it, you never know, you might say, I'd like to keep doing this to be a small group leader. How many people do you need? Just one other person other than yourself? That's church. Jesus says, where two or three gather in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So on your own, it'd be a bit lonely, but find somebody. You don't have to have 30 people. In fact, the ideal number is probably a dozen or so, or, and I reckon even smaller, I reckon four or five people talking, sharing, having a meal, praying for each other, praying for their needs thinking of those people on their hearts who, who are lost out there. So I want to encourage you. So here's some action points that we can all do in our small groups. Pray for the people in your world. Pray for the people in your world. And so in a small group where you might have three or four of you, you might have four or five people on your hearts. I tell you, when you start praying for people that are in your world and uh, God starts doing stuff, Miracles start to happen. You can't pray in faith with love for people and calling out on the Lord and interceding for people. In fact, it's much better to be praying to God about people before you speak to people about God. Does that make sense? Pray to God about the people way before you speak to them about God because then he prepares hearts and he will enable you. So pray for the people in your world and we can ask our small group, to regularly pray with us for those we love and people we come across who don't yet know Jesus. And then allow the Holy Spirit to lead you to invite some people. You can't invite everyone. But I'm talking about the people that you're building substantial relationship with. Purposefully invite them, being led of God, to come along to one of our services. Or if Christianity in church, it's, too, it's like a negative to them, the home, come for a meal. We've got alpha groups going, come to my home. And if they know you and have a relationship with you, then that becomes a doorway in. And, uh, and so I encourage you to allow the Holy Spirit who lives in you to lead you in this and to invite some people. And, and you never know in this 40 days of prayer, as we pray, there will be people that will come that will ultimately come to Christ. They won't come on a Sunday, but they'll come to your home group. Just have lots of good Greek food there and they'll come. (laughs) 
I've said to pastors, I said, guys, you can build a church through your home. What do you mean? So just love on people, have them into your home and, and, and share food and talk and, and, and small groups and, and you can actually build a community through your home. And why wouldn't God bring people in? You start praying for them, then invite and, and, and allow the Holy Spirit to lead you in this. Thirdly, offer to pray for the sick and the troubled. Be courageous and yet sensitive in how you approach people. There are so many people that are sick out there. So many people that are troubled. And most people, if you ask them, when you find out that they're, they're sick and troubled, say, look, would you, I'd love to be able to have the opportunity to pray for you. Would you like me to pray for you? In our church, we pray and, and we believe that Jesus can heal. Now, most people that you have relationship with, that know you and you're a credible person, say, oh, okay. If you go to a stranger and do it insensitively, then you're a nut. You're a religious kook. And no one's going to respond to a religious kook. Okay? We're talking about connecting with people that you know and you have some credibility with. Be bold. Be courageous. You never know. Jesus could work through you to bring healing into that person's life. There have been times when I've talked to people that are sick and praying with them and, and, and I've thought, you know what? I need to help them find a good doctor. They're just not getting the right medical intervention or I think you need to go and see a spirit. People just need help and support and sometimes it, it means, I think there's a practical problem here that can be resolved very quickly. And so, so praying for a person, God can heal them instantly or he may guide you with love to say, look, there, there may be a source that, we, that, that I can direct you to somebody. If your doctor's fobbing you off, let's find a better doctor. So offer to pray for the sick and needy. And wherever Jesus' presence is, so is his power. And so believe that he can work through you. It doesn't say, bring them to church and Pastor Phil and Pastor Cass and Pastor Alan, they'll do the praying because they're the pastors. No, no, no. It says believers will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You're a believer. Are you a believer? Do you believe that God can work through your prayers? Of course he can. You can't heal, but he can in response to a heart that's full of love for people and genuinely concerned for their needs. And you call out to him and you just don't know what he could do in bringing healing into your life. Personally welcome precious people home to become part of our family by belonging to our small group, even before they're ready to believe in Jesus. You might say, oh, my small group has got too many people now. I'm chock-a-block full. We've got run out of seats. Hey, eh? There's always room for one more. Who needs a seat? Sit on the floor. <laughs> for those that have been around to say, there's always room for more people, for hungry hearts, for needy people. And intentionally look out for others and include them. And so when someone is visiting, particularly our services and or your small group, so no one's left behind. There were some people here, there was a guy in um, our 8.30 service and it was his, um, I think, second time along. So I'm ready to go up to my study to look over my message and correct the mistakes I made at 8.30 so I don't make them at 10.30. And that's why it's good you can preach four times the same message if you actually improve it. But tonight it's fantastic. And, I'm, and I see him, and he's about to go. I said, hey, how you doing? What's your name? And I said, you've been here before? He goes, oh, yeah, I came a couple of weeks ago. Do you know anyone? He goes, oh, there's somebody that I said hello. And so there was Billy Slapkus, and, I, and I'm looking at Billy. He looks at my eyes like he knows what I'm saying. Go after him, please, with love. So I connected him to Bill and someone else to, just to connect with people. It's easy to, to think someone else will do it. You don't know what the needs of people are. As people come into our services, you may be new here today for the first time. I trust you have already felt the love of Christ, the acceptance of people. We're not here to badger people. We're not here to force people. We're here to love, care, support, and pray that Jesus will become so important in your life that he becomes your anchor, your strength, your support, your saviour, your Lord. That, that's our purpose. And, so, and finally, introduce people to Jesus. Be their biggest cheer squad when they give their lives to him and, and be their support network. 
available and faithful brothers and sisters who will stick with them and, and uh, as they learn to follow Christ as well. We need each other. We need models. I shared about David being doing it to me back in 1971, 72. In fact, he started in the mid-60s. Do you know, he's still a young man. I won't tell him how old you are, Dave. He's still doing it. Amen. David, come and share with us how you're doing it and, and the story of that lady just a, a, a little while ago. David runs a small group up in the hills or just in the foothills. And he's got a great story of how God has worked through him. He'll share it. We live at, we live at Sky and... Uh, And we originally thought, just for the eastern siders, you know, that, that there would be a, a venue that would it be easy for them to relate uh, to, uh, to our home. So what has actually worked out, though, is that we have people, you know, the eastern area, it's a large area, so we have people crossing town, in fact, to, to come to our group, and we're very grateful for that. And our age range from late 20s through to my age uh, would Mid-50s. be the... <laughs> uh, would be our, our members. So we uh, really appreciate each other. Over the, the weeks and the months that we've been meeting, we've become really great friends. And uh, always our home is open. Uh, Kathy, my wife, actually uh, has a meal every time for our, our members. And uh, we're grateful that um, we're able to do that. Um, it is true, though, that, that we have um, also worked Life together, you know, life does present often little issues and problems and, and uh, some of our group, in fact all of us have probably gone through different uh, episodes of life where we've needed support of each other and prayer and uh, we've been able to, to, together, to, to work together. It is life together in a small group. So we've always been open, though. We're not an exclusive group. We've yeah, always good. had that door open for more uh, people to join us. Um, and so it was back in early September last year that um, uh, one of our lovely Chinese ladies who attends our church, uh, Yuling, might be here today, um, is, is introduced to my wife, Kathy, a Chinese lady that she had met and had invited along to, to CFC. So Kathy met her and invited her to our life group. So she accepted. She lives at College Park and was able to, uh, to come up that, that more distance up to us. And so the very first night that she came, uh, had dinner with her and with the rest of the group. And uh, so we didn't know anything. Her name is Mary. We knew nothing about it whatsoever. So in the group, we all went around, said who we were, what we do in life, you know, very quickly. So Mary was the last to speak, and I, you know, particularly said, look, you know, we wouldn't want to embarrass you. You don't have to share anything, uh, just, you know, your name even. She said, no, I'm very happy to share uh, the fact that I'm, I'm an atheist, I'm not a Christian. Uh, I was born and raised in communist China, that's my background, and uh, however, she said, I- I'm, um, my mother in China has become a Christian. And so she's saying to me, I should find a Christian group and talk to them about the validity of the Christian faith. So she said, that's why I- I've also come tonight, to just, in fact, she said, I'd like to hear, you know, your group, all of you, tell me, how did you become a Christian? What motivated you? Well, you know what? David Hersey stepped back and the whole group took over. (laughs) They talked about their own experience, their faith, how they arrived at at a faith in Christ. So, in fact, that was the beginning for Mary. Um, She has certainly attended every group that we've had ever since and we've seen the growth. She bought her own Chinese-English Bible uh, she's been uh, now connecting to a uh, uh, Chinese-speaking church in the city, and we've seen the growth. You know, we gave her lots of DVDs and, and, and books, and of course, our studies changed. We talked about the resurrection. We talked about our own resurrection. And so there was, she arrived at the stage where she said, you know, I, I, really, I really now have reason for faith. And she said it was only just last week that I went to 
my Chinese church and they had a baptismal service. And she said, you know, I felt for the first time Jesus, his Holy Spirit really touched my life. I know now the reality of, of knowing Christ. So she said uh, to us along the way, she said, you know, the, the, the thing that really has helped me too is the love that I've seen in your group. Yeah, that good. has been something that has really overwhelmed me. Yeah. That's good. So she said her mother was a very angry lady and, you know, she said, she's changed. I can see the outworking of Christ's life in her. So by Christmas time, she was saying, you know, this is good, Christmas with, with Christ. So we're convinced that she's uh, on the journey. I, I, I feel confident she really has found a faith in, in Christ. But it's ongoing. She's going to continue to be with us in our groups. And she did say on the very first night, she said, you prayed before the meal. I could never pray. I, you know, well, well, how do you do that? How do you pray? Well, we've got 40 days of prayer right. coming up. So uh, right, right. we're looking yeah. forward to taking that a step further. So we're very grateful that, in fact, Christ is alive and there are people just like Mary, uh, maybe in our church today, that are open to, to go further, to come to someone's home. And, hey, you can still come to ours, even though we might be out of the, the, the district a little bit from here. Uh, we're, we've got an open door. Wonderful. Thank you, Dave. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Great. It's my prayer that we would have dozens and dozens of Marys come into Christ through our connect groups, through our life groups as we're calling them. And I want to encourage you, if you are not part of a life group, sign up today. You can. If you'd like to be a host, do it. Have a go. Step out in faith. If your house is reasonably clean, turn it into a home of hospitality and welcome and... and uh, <laughs> Hey, the early church met on dirt floors. Hey, go, go. And, so it, it's what's in your heart. If there's love and acceptance, it's not the physical thing. And, and may God use us to see many, many people come to faith. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved, but it was in an environment that was attractive, that was magnetic, that was loving, loving Christ, loving people, accepting, being open to the other. Father, thank you for David's story. Thank you for this amazing scripture. And Lord, as we come around your table now and just conclude the series by taking the Lord's Supper, a little bit of wine, a little bit of bread that speaks to us of what it's all about and, and, and how it came to be that we could be experiencing your presence and your life and love. It's because you sent your son to die in our place so that we could be forgiven, cleansed, changed and restored back to you, our sins forgiven. And so, Lord, as we come around your table now, touch each of our hearts, move us by the Holy Spirit to love Jesus and to love one another and to be open to the other, to welcome people home into our community. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, bring the emblems to us as we sing a song. If you're one of our guests here today, you can take these emblems. And if physical representations of, of Jesus' death on a cross. It's not the Christian Family Center's table, it's the Lord's table. Even if you haven't accepted Christ yet as your saviour, this can help you as a step of faith as you take these emblems. It'll help you to believe. If you want to pass, let it pass you by. For any of us, feel free. But let's enter into celebrating the Lord's, the Lord's Supper and concluding our message and the series. Thank you, guys. Lead us in the song.
Let's stand together, church. Just give me power. Praise his name. As we stand in his presence, just a little bit of wine, grape juice and biscuit, just a physical element. But Jesus said, do it as often as you can. Why? So we don't ever forget why he came to earth came to earth to show you exactly what God the Father is like. He was fully human. He was the God-man, fully human, and yet totally divine at the same time. So that we get a correct picture of who God is. Our loving, kind, merciful Father in heaven. We don't have an angry God, even though he hates sin and he hates the devil and he hates evil and he hates injustice and he wants to overturn it. He knows ultimately the only way it can be overturned was by sending his son to deal with the barrier between sinful humanity and a perfect God. And King hit the devil to ultimately strip him of his authority and to save humanity so that we can be forgiven and changed and filled with his spirit and then empowered to try and do as much good in this evil world that we live in, to endeavor to love the unlovely, to help and to be part of the answer, part of his gospel force to let people know that he's alive. That's why we do church and why we're encouraging you to start small groups. Church, it's, it's all about Jesus and we're holding our emblems our hands, these emblems that speak that it's his death on a cross 2,000 years ago that removed an impassable barrier between you and God the Father. And that's all your sins and mistakes. They are forgiven when you believe in Jesus. They are removed and no longer count between God and us. There's no barrier now. Forgiveness has come. Peace with God is a reality. Love is the way of life now, not retribution. If you're standing here today and you're holding these emblems and you've never believed on him, will you believe upon him now and say, Jesus, become my saviour? Like Mary, yes, Lord, I, I want to believe. Help me to believe. Help my unbelief. I trust you now to save me, to forgive me. If you've never done that, do that now as you're standing here. And for the rest of us who are the already convinced, who are believers, say, Lord, help me to live the life you want me to live, to love like you love, to let your light shine through me, to be welcoming to people, to be ready to speak courageously, even to pray for those that are sick and troubled. Help me, Lord, through your spirit living in me, empower me. His spirit comes because the cross has occurred. The gift of forgiveness flows from the cross as we believe. 
and the gift of the Holy Spirit comes because he rose from the dead and he's in heaven. He sent the Spirit now to represent him, to live in you. You can do all things through Christ now who strengthens you. So Lord, we give you praise. We give you thanks. And Lord, we pray for many people to come to faith, that many people will be welcomed home into your church, the Christian Family Centre here over the coming weeks and months. So Lord, use us all for your glory. We give you praise for Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection on our behalf. Let us eat and drink together now.